Hello, and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? It's a podcast aimed at folks who, just like Neo in the Matrix, feel a deep sense of dislocation. This podcast is for badass people who want to talk about heavy things, but they want to talk about them lightly. We'll use theology and history and philosophy and years of deeply immersive experiences in foreign cultures to figure out how did, how, how did we get here again? Our pod goes beyond rhetorical rabbits. Those are that quickly reproduced media memes and marketing widgets that big media loves to use to make them some money. Instead, we examine contemporary cultural phenomena looking for the small and the big T's, the truths embedded therein, because it's in there. Join me, John Hears, and our team of First Things Foundation field workers as we wonder, why are we talking about rabbits? This is episode three, marriage and making love so fine. So we've been talking about light people. People who start to see the world differently starting around 1650 or so. So in history parlance, the 17th century, people who emphasize the rational in lots of ways, they tend to worship the mind. I call them in this podcast, the light people. I'm a light person and I'm a a white person. I mean, that's what I would be called today. And well, most light people followers of the Enlightenment, well, they were white when this very interesting and new world way of thinking became a thing. They were white. Today, all types of people, black, brown, red, white, yellow, are light people. In fact, last week we talked about how some light people have decided to pay other light people reparations through Venmo because, well, white light people owe black light people a debt. That's the way the thinking goes. And that debt was incurred when enlightened Europeans did some pretty unenlightened things like slavery. Womp, womp. Terrible. Last week, I read you some emails in order to better understand the phenomena. So in the interest of interesting things, I want to do a quick update before I get into love and marriage and all that stuff. So here's an update on last week's podcast, and I'm going to use the email string that I used last week, but from stuff I got today. So these are folks I referenced last week. It's a, it's, it's a group of good people trying to figure out, hey, how do we take action in 2020 to honor black folks? So this one, the one I'm going to read about, came today, and it was one of a lot of emails, okay? But this one's just too fascinating to pass up. we got to talk about it, okay? It starts like this. Remember, it's an email string about reparations and how this particular company can get it right. Quote, I am a white person, and I am feeling some anxiety and nervousness that some black folks on this list may not have received any payments yet. I'm wondering if more organization could be helpful. I have a thought. The quote goes on, or the the email goes on. I have a thought. If white folks and non-black POCs, people of color, were to Venmo a specific individual And then that person could distribute the payments to all the black folks on this list. Then the reparations would be anonymous and from a collective community. Unquote. Now they finish. Quote. I say this knowing some things. To begin, this is my first time participating in the reparations process. I have a lot to learn. Second, I am aware that making things unnecessarily complicated and overprocessed is, in fact, a characteristic of white supremacy and also individualism, too. Unquote. Wow. I'm going to read that last part again. 
as this person goes through, they're saying, hey, maybe we can do this reparations things in a better, more organized way. And then they say, I am aware that making things unnecessarily complicated and over-processed is, in fact, a characteristic of white supremacy and also individualism, too, unquote. Now, I read this to you as a way to say the mind of this very kind person is doing something very weird. It's displaying that odd enlightenment style trait, the characteristic of the scientific mind. And what is that trait? The modern mind must analyze itself, Rene Descartes. It's got to see itself here and then over there. And then like in a funhouse mirror, it sees itself everywhere all of a sudden. And then and in its really tortured kind of way, this very kind person, this is a good person, is coming to some incredibly odd conclusions. First among them for me anyway, is that being white is the same as being scientifically minded. Being white is being rational. Clearly in her email, being white is akin to being controlling. And being white is akin to being individualistic in mind. <laughs> and here's the funny part. She's right. <laughs> Almost. But not really. I say she's right because she's onto something, but she's super wrong. It's not wild. It's not white people that do this. It's light people. It's the enlightened people born out of Europe after the Renaissance. They think a certain way. This person in the email is describing a lig, a religion, a way of knowing the good. And then, in a most scientific and rational way, but also just foolishly, she's attributing it to race, to pigmentation. White people don't think like this because they are light-skinned. They think like this because they've been dipped in the enlightenment. You see, I don't think like this. I don't, I don't think rationally because I'm, I have a pigmentation. They're not related. I think like this because my entire culture has dipped me in this enlightenment lig, this religion of the light people. But guess what? Black people got dipped into that too. And brown people and yellow people and every people that ever got on a boat, forced or not, and came to this country, they got dipped. Like one of those delicious, soft, swirly ice cream cones. They got dipped. We got dipped. I got dipped. And the color of the dipping, the sauce is not white. It's light. It's enlightenment. It's whatever that thing is. I don't know. Let's pick a color. Um, fuchsia. You see, I'm a light person. And the worst of that cult, the enlightenment cult or culture, the worst of it is very bad indeed. This person is onto something. We should all work against those very inhuman, robotic, over-rationalized, right? Those computer-like tendencies found in the religion of the rational mind. The lig of the Enlightenment philosophers has a lot of bad stuff in it. But whiteness and blackness, they're, they're just not really a part of the game. Not deep down. Not way down there where the sickness lies. Not down in the heart. That's from last week. Not down there or in the middle of there. Right down there we got our, we got all our emotions. Up in our mind we got our reason. And then in the heart, this other thing that we talked about last week. In there we have some issues, right? In the heart. And that brings us to the fun stuff. Why are we talking about rabbits? Today, we're going to talk about love and marriage and hearts and hugs and sexual intercourse. And the notebook with Ryan Gosling and Titanic. Yes. Romance. 
on today's podcast. That updates something, right? It's crazy. It's not crazy. It's just fascinating. There's a new religion being born, man. There's a new leg. People are rejecting the old leg of the Enlightenment. I don't even know if they know that they're doing it. It's fascinating. So most of us, us light people, we think of marriage and we think of some kind of boardwalk of life. Like it's a stop along the stroll that is a boardwalk, maybe in Jersey, right? We're walking. And one of the stops is marriage. I mean, I, I do. I did. I think like that. I can remember as a young man, like wondering, who's she going to be? Who's going to be my love? You know what I mean? Now there was lovers and then there's the love. The love is like romantic. These are romantic thoughts. I wondered, who's it going to be? Right? And not that a lot of men in the 1980s and 90s were sharing thoughts out loud like that, but I mean, I was a romantic dude. Romance is a thing. So, right? As a stop on the boardwalk of life, marriage seems natural to us growing up in the West. It's like we're meant for it. And I like that phrase, meant for it, right? Those words are pregnant with a kind of entitlement, like I get to have that. I'm meant for that. Yep, that's me. I'm meant for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just wait till your time comes. You're going to get what you deserve. And marriage is part of what I'm meant for. It's like I get to do that. It's one of the things human beings do, right? And the best part about it is when you're young is there's a kind of romantic inheritance to it. Like it's sexual, it's sensual, it's a thing and it's exciting. And it, the Greeks called it lust, but not in like that bad way. We talked about that last week. It's not about like very bad. It's a thing that happens to all human beings. And when rightly ordered, it's a good thing, but it's exciting, it's way different than like, oh, my first day at my job at the cubicle. Marriage is, whoa, it's exciting, right? Marriage for light people comes as a type of ticket that gets you into an amusement park of romance. It's the thing that dreams are made of, but not in history. I mean, not in that old world history, which the show is all about trying to figure out back and forth between the new and the old. Not really at all, actually. See, in teaching not a few classes on this and reading not a few books, one of which is a book by Stephanie Kuntz called The History of Marriage. It's good. It's solid. It gets wacky, but it helps. It becomes pretty clear when studying this stuff that marriage is definitely a stop on the boardwalk of life, but uh, that stop looks like a subway station. Like the D train, like, uh, I don't know, 77th Street, like that, okay? And uh, it's the kind of stop that when you get on and you sit down, you realize you don't know who's driving it. It just starts moving. And the driver's definitely not you. You know, you're sitting there with your pal who's also a pal you can have sex with because they're your wife or your husband, but neither of you seems particularly <laughs> in charge as this vehicle heads off. We're definitely not driving. And this feeling of being sort of, well, in a vehicle you're not in charge of, well, that immediately complicates the romantic stuff that you signed up for in the first place. That's marriage, man, for a lot of people. It's a vehicle. And for Westerners who get married much less often now, it's a vehicle that, uh oh, the doors have closed behind you. It's a suffocating kind of vehicle for New Worlders. Notice people in Europe don't get married, man. You see, when you get into that vehicle, you're being transported. And in the old world, that vehicle was seen as super essential. It was a stop on the boardwalk of life, but it was one that you you needed, no matter how kind of scary it was and no matter how you didn't know who was driving the thing, right? It was necessary in the old world to be married, and it was necessary for your, and here we go, a list of words that are all going to have the same feel to it. 
for your salvation, for your redemption, for your health and well-being, for your metamorphosis, for your comic release, for your becoming one with the universe, becoming one with who you were always supposed to be, for your entrance into the pearly gates. Marriage had this kind of connotation, like you needed it, and it was religious in some ways. See, what you hopped into, before the Enlightenment anyway, was a vehicle for your transformation, not just transportation. You weren't trying to get someplace and somewhere. You were trying to be transformed. Marriage is a vehicle in this way, in the old world, that protects you from a super bumpy ride called life, while at the same time coaching you up for heaven. In a nutshell, that's how pre-Enlightenment people understood marriage. There's way more to it. Some of you are going, no, that's not true. It was for baby making. Yeah, that's part of it too. But I'm giving you the theological and right and the philosophical reasons for it. But let's keep going. Now, why a vehicle? Well, it's because of the environment. You see, it's the streets and the world between here and there, between now and death. Those streets are mean. That's how the old worlders knew it. You know it too, new world people. You know poverty and COVID and war and famine. Kuntz, in her book, History of Marriage, writes all about these things as reasons for old world contractual marriage. And it's true. Old world marriage was a vehicle meant to restrain these forces of poverty and COVID and war and famine. But it's way deeper than that. In many old world traditions, the marriage vehicle also did this incredible thing. It cleaned you from the inside. See, the environment, the environment the vehicle is meant to protect you from, it resides both outside and within. It's your sucky way of living, your very sucky way of being, that the vehicle of marriage is also out to repair. See, Selfishness, greed, narcissism, it's a long list. These are the things that screw us up, not unlike COVID, CNN, and Fox News. But greed and narcissism, and you name it, there's lots of spiritual ailments, they are inside of us. We brought them into the subway car called marriage. But in the old world, marriage has this, at least it's understood as having the powers, these cool powers to siphon out and distill these spiritual maladies. It has the ability to rid you of spiritual toxins. And then it does this incredible thing where it rids you of the toxins and then presents them to you against your will, like little cancers dug out and presented to you as a revelation about, hey, look, look who you were. Look who you are. This is the old world conception. Look who you were. You were sucky. But look, we dug it out. You're waking up. That's the notion of marriage. You're waking up and walking out of the matrix. You're becoming woke. Woke. Like really woke. That's what old world marriage in many old world traditions pre-enlightenment was meant to do. I've seen it. Let me tell you about an old couple in Mali. A Muslim couple. Well, they're not actually a couple because, see, Dauda, my friend, was the husband to Takadi, who I love dearly, but she was one of three wives. But weirdly, Dauda had the same take on this whole thing as many other old world people. He used to say this phrase, Nebi Sirata Tla, 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 Nebi Sirata Tla. He said, I'm being made to go straight. Right, His wives were making him be straight. This isn't about his sexual preferences. This was about him being bent as a man, and then they were helping him get straight. He actually called it a cast. And it was a cast like you put on a broken arm that was meant to straighten and heal the bone. He's the bone. Marriage is the cast. Right? And of course, he talked about having kids because that's also an old world thing, like big time. We'll get to that. 
So does that sound weird to you? Wait a minute. So there's the premise of marriage. Like, so why should I get married again? So I can announce all my vulnerabilities and how crappy I am at life. And then what? <laughs> and like, you're going to heal me through this vehicle. It sounds awful. You don't like it, right? I don't blame you. The old world is weird. And this isn't meant to convince you of it. It's meant to simply enlighten you to a type of thinking that we as light people have almost no access to anymore. But I always ask myself, it does feel weird, but is it weird and untrue? See, it feels weird and true. Let's take a look at Hindu uh, marriage ceremonies for a second. Very old world, right? Like 5,000 years old, old. Okay, in the marriage ceremony in, in Hinduism, and now this is hard to explain, but in a hot second, there's a whole bunch of variations on this. There is a marriage in Hinduism, but there's so many variations on it in the Vedic marriage tradition. But so think of us like red. There's lots of red things and there's all variations of red, right? But they're all red-ish. This is marriage in India. Okay, you get it? It always includes, however, almost always a knot tying ceremony. It's called the Mangal Sutra. This ceremony gives husband and wife the authority to help the other commit beautiful acts of dharma. Now, the key word is there, authority. The ceremony gives authority to the man and to the woman alike to help the other commit beautiful acts of dharma. Dharma is cosmic good, but it's deeper than that. At one point in the ceremony, the couple asks the guru, the spiritual leader, to let them into the marriage because each wants to begin the disposal of their arani. Arani is their debts, the debts they've acquired, and here's spiritual debts there. The stuff they're dragging into the marriage, they turn to each other and then each of them asks the guru, hey, spiritual leader guy, let me into this marriage because I want to dispose of my arani. And guess what? The guru tells him, yes, you're in, because out there you can't dispose of your arani, your debts. You can't do it alone. It's not possible. Come in to the vehicle and dispose, dissolve, destroy your debts. If you like the word sin there, because it makes it Western, you get it. It's not really the same thing, but of your impurities. So. What's the teaching there? You can't do it on your own. So each needs the other. And in the real old Vedic school, and this part's super cool, the woman represents thought. She's an icon of thought. And the man is the image of action, thought and action. And each needs the other in order to properly dispose of arani. You see, thoughts beget action, and action is impossible without thought. Man and woman, ah! We need both in order to do the thing, dispose of arani, our debts. Together, both are on a vehicle moving them toward purity, salvation, or what the Hindu tradition calls moksha, release from death. And guess what? A very similar mode of marriage is in play for Christians. It's always has been, at least for the old world Christians. Those cats, we're calling them orthodox Christians because that's what they are. They wear crowns when they get married. I'm one of those people. I wore a crown. Mine was gold and sat pretty high on my head. Actually, I think we had Greek ones. Yeah, we had flowers. My wife's going to kill me. But we had crowns when we got married. I stood beside my wife 24 years ago. She stood there. We both had crowns on our head. We look cool. We look like royalty. And all my new world friends, who I love and adore, they were like, those guys are like kings and queens on their big day. Yeah, but no, that's not how it works. We were united and we look like kings and queens, but actually the crown represents martyrdom. So for a lot of you out there, martyrdom, yeah, it's cool, like dying, like blowing yourself up or something. That's not what it is in this particular case. What it is is think of that famous painting by Paul Rubens. He's a Baroque painter, 1612. You've seen it. 
It's like a naked Jesus. Well, a top, top naked Jesus with a really harsh crown of thorns on his head. And he's staring up and there's blood coming down his forehead. Right. This is a Renaissance painting. Well, so right in the right in the edge of the Enlightenment, this painting shows this crown of thorns just just digging into Jesus's head. Right. The crown that I was wearing is the image of that crown. Right. The crowns that my wife and I wore are the present reality of that martyrdom, death to self. Yep. That was our marriage party. That was our big dance gig, death to self. That's fun. Woo. Romance. It's true, though. It's what it was. You see, the goal of the old world Orthodox Christian married couple is to become a martyr. And what are you killing inside of you? Yeah, greed, selfishness, all the lust, all the stuff that are like impurities. Think of, again, of the broken arm. You're trying to put a cast on it. Like Dowd has said with his three wives. You get it. But gosh, this is so not the notebook. With starring Ryan Gosling. I forget who the woman is in it. I should know that. Right? It's definitely not The Sun is Also a Star. That just came out. Very romantic. My daughters and I watch that. It's very nice. It's definitely not Titanic. The stuff I just relayed to you about martyrdom and vehicles and yeah, it's not in those movies. Yeah, it's not even Pride and Prejudice. Okay, and that was 150 years ago. Now, nah, compared to those movies, I mean, we're talking, it feels depressing. But man, it's not. Well, it's not unless there's something like an afterlife. Then it's like the best vehicle ride you could ever take because it goes all the way to space and like, into the clouds where Jesus is. That's the common dumb conception that so many of my friends tell me. Like, you believe in that? Yeah, no, I don't believe in a Jesus in a cloud. That's probably not the thing. Okay? But man, if there is a, a world that's not this one, or that's this one and it's just right here with us right now, we're just not able to see it. If there is something else, then man, maybe this vehicle will take me to space. Or at least teach me how much of a loser I am. And then, by definition of having learned that, I become less of a loser. Because I become aware and awoke to who I am. And you know what? Maybe all that pleases the creator God's sprites or whatever they are that's waiting for me. And guess what? Maybe I become ready for such a world. Whatever it is. In our tradition, that's mine, the Orthodox tradition, it's unity with God. And so that's why the old school concept of marriage is what it is, because there's an afterlife, and that's about a God, which is an ultimate good, and that's why the old world ligament smells and tastes and feels the way it does, because that ligament is always about becoming pleasing to something bigger than yourself. And that brings me to Michael Jordan. Did you see The Last Dance? Top notch. I got a friend I wanted to put on a phone call right now. I couldn't get a hold of him, but he's coming in on this. Top notch stuff. An NBA guy. But check it out. In The Last Dance, the documentary about Michael Jordan, you see him doing really hard stuff year after year. He's being really hard on himself and really hard on his teammates. And something tells me that during the course of that 10 episode series, that there wouldn't have been a documentary because there wouldn't have been a Michael Jordan if there hadn't been something called the NBA Finals. If there wasn't a golden thing called the Larry O'Brien Trophy, something tells me that Mike and all of his Bulls buddies, they would have been doing something else in life if there was no finals. And in the old world, there's definitely always a final. And in the old world, you don't pass the final by using a paper and writing on pencil 
Well, let me flip that. <laughs> you don't pass by using a pencil to write answers on a paper. No. Now, the final for the old world folks is not in your mind. It's the acquisition of something deep in your heart. So, next time, let's keep this theme going a little bit and talk about marriage again, but this time between people who share the same body parts. Men marrying men, women marrying women. And let's put it in the context of the old world and figure out what the heck's going on there. What does the old world say about this? And how come the old world people, even around today, you can bump into them, come to Uganda with us? Or West that way, they don't seem very happy about this concept. They seem pretty pissed off. Why don't they just calm down? Why don't they just let people be people? Next time, let's try to figure it out. On why are we talking about rabbits? Shani's Gagi Marjos to all of y'all. That's again from the Georgian Republic, and that means to you the victory. That's set at the KP table. I hope you all come and have one of those parties with us. In fact, invite us and we'll come to your place and throw one. They're amazing. That's our pod for today. Thank you for coming along. Watar, that's why are we talking about rabbits is produced by Andrew Short and Daniel Paternos. And our pod is brought to you by the creators of First Things Foundation. That's a nonprofit that lives and works in some of the world's most just badass but very very tough neighborhoods we immerse there in order to create momentum for local change makers people we call impresarios we do this to support them and their vision of a better life share this watar episode with your friends hit us up with a solid review on itunes and everywhere you get your podcasts your love for us allows us to love and serve others and go about our business of trying to get to the end the nba finals end Peace to you, Nachwamdis, hasta luego, Cambufo, and peace out.